Well, hey, everybody, what's up? Welcome to the White Knuckle Podcast, powered by Ozonix. Undetectable, undeniable. Well, hey, everybody, happy holidays. Uh, thanks for tuning in to episode number 47 of the White Knuckle Podcast. Before we get too far into the show, I just want to apologize for Todd and I's lack of attention to detail or staying on track or whatever it was we totally intended this show to be about uh our sponsors and it definitely was about our sponsors and um christmas gifts and things of that nature but uh, we got a little off track and i just couldn't help myself but publish it so uh i hope you enjoy it uh i hope you find uh at least some of the information in there useful and i also hope you get a laugh out of some of it so with that uh here is the show that todd and i recorded last week well hey everybody welcome back to the white knuckle podcast today todd is joined with me over in iowa via skype and uh, we're here to talk about uh the gear that we used over the last course of the year in the hopes that we might give y'all something to uh, ask your wives or significant other or husband for for christmas right todd oh absolutely man we um this time of year it's the equipment that we use like i've gotten such a process down over the years and after hunting for months on end you just become like almost immune to it but um boy i i have come to the conclusion of i'm using some of the best stuff out there just because i break everything else <laughs> so uh my backpack you should see my backpack right now it's something else i'm not going to name the brand but i mean i ripped the uh and i bought it i think i don't even remember but i um i ripped the um the waist strap off so i have that tied on all half the zippers are blown out i've had to replace the the uh, the draws with um with pieces of rope and stuff because dude i mean you're, we're just packing these things in and out four times a day basically one time in one time out all the equipment it just takes its toll and year after year of all that that abuse you kind of learn what works and what doesn't work um so yeah man it's a passion of mine the product end and i design this stuff for a living so it's interesting and sometimes painful uh for me to enjoy different things because i analyze everything and some that takes the joy out of it to be honest (laughs) (laughs) Well, you mentioned backpacks, and I'm just going to um, spout off here for a second. I used, uh, honestly, reluctantly, I used the uh, Ozonix Kinetic Pack this year, and I I used it sparingly the years before just because I got it late in the season. We weren't able to get our hands on one till later, and I know I don't think you have one. Do you, Todd? <clears throat> I do. I just have too much junk. Gotcha. So, and you're you're hunting a little bit different situation than I am, but uh, just from my perspective, uh, packing in a mile, a couple miles, twenty five, whatever the case may be, um, I I got to give that um, Ozonix Kinetic Pack a thumbs up for a couple different reasons. One, um, it fit me nicely. Uh, two, I was able to fit everything in it, um, including a, a HR three hundred that cost five six hundred dollars um and that it had a pouch that was specifically designed to to um, protect that and what i was doing was putting that pack on and then over top of that i would put my lone wolf um assault uh hang on uh two over top of that along with sticks and etc so i have to say that held up really good halfway through the year I had beat the tar out of it. Obviously, you can imagine being underneath the tree stand and and getting hooked on um, the tree stand and things of that nature. It had ripped, and uh, I talked to Ozonix about it, and they're like, "Uh, yeah, you know what? We'd like that back because we'd like to see exactly what happened, and they sent me a different one, and and, uh, that one has really been flawless. So I did not expect to uh, have that kind of feedback uh or be i did not expect to be able to give that kind of feedback uh with respect to that pouch i really or that that pack i really liked it well that's cool man i'm actually this year at the ata show that's one of the things on my list i want to check out the different brands uh, of packs out there it's one of the things we don't have a sponsor for and to be honest if you know white knuckle we don't have 400 sponsors we have the essential ones that we enjoy and we can do a really good job of promoting but there's so many different i mean you could have 100 sponsors but there's just not enough time and energy to take care of them all so 
Uh, backpacks is something we don't have a sponsor. I'm going to look at Sitka for sure because I know they have some good quality stuff. I've had Sitka packs before, um, and some of the old ones I've worn out. I mean, I, I've been through them all. But um, I'm going to check out packs this year. Uh, there's another one. Um, uh, Jason, what was the name of that pack that uh, you were checking out that they were they were talking about doing some of them uh, for Lone Wolf? Oh, Kafaru. Yeah, I want to. I, I I know they have a really good reputation as well, so I want to check out some of their packs. And you know, sometimes we're in a cool position where, as we've been growing our business, um, a lot of the sponsors we've met along the way, we've kind of helped develop their products. Uh, I've been in some really cool meetings with some different companies over the years, uh, and Ozonics is one of them where you know they took a lot of our feedback directly from the field, uh, and we helped them design and develop the next generation of uh, of products. Um, so. You know, who knows? We might be able to help uh, a pack company out there do the same thing, just for our own needs. Yeah, we but, had a we had a brief conversation with Aaron Snyder, um, or I had a brief conversation with Aaron. I think it was early in the summer. No, excuse me, early in the spring, and and we had sort of made tentative plans to get together um, and sort of collaborate with you on a um, a possible whitetail pack. Um, or more of a white tail pack than what they had, and I just think that because of schedules, etc., I don't know that that thing is um, that pack is any farther, or, or maybe it doesn't even exist in product development. I'm not sure. We haven't had a conversation about it, but we'll definitely that'll be on our list of things to check here uh, next month at the ATA show. For sure, and I mean it's it's one of those things. There's a bunch of good ones out there, and sometimes the best thing you can do is just go out there and and check them out, try them on, and see. Uh, for me, I have such a specific need that i know what i want and i'm looking for and it's always tough to fill that but um let's let's kind of continue on to the next topic i i want to start kind of just right like bare bones with my bow um i know you shoot an elite i've been shooting elite for years and years um they uh i'm shooting an elite impulse 31 i dig a really small short compact bow um, for the setups that i'm hunting and self-filming from i like a very compact bow uh, i don't want anything fancy it it has a Super draw cycle. It's crazy fast, super quiet, very simple. There's not much to it. it it's just, you know, a good all around awesome hunting bow, and that's all I am concerned about. Uh, what elite are you shooting right now, Jason? I am also shooting the Impulse with the 34. I, uh, the, the, the draw length that I wanted, <clears throat> excuse me, just did not come in the 31. Um, that extra half inch that I needed. Um, on on my draw length was exactly what the doctor ordered in the impulse 34 so that's that's what i'm shooting and i absolutely love it i've had a had it a year and a half uh and i shoot better with that than i have with any of the other bows and i've had a couple different elite bows three or four um and i'm uh i'm yeah i'm, I'm super happy with it it's fun for me because with these, with all the new equipment, um, I'm not a speed freak. I'm a hunter. Everything that I shoot year round is 100% based on hunting. Um, the, the, the elite system that I've been using for all these years, the biggest reason I loved them is just to say it had a super silky smooth draw cycle, an extremely hard, um, uh, what do they call it? Knock back wall, back wall. There you go. Uh, you can see my technology coming out, you know, um, but I basically, dude, they're just a really, really nice all-around bow. And I, so speed was always secondary, but that impulse is smoking fast. So for me, my shooting at 40 and 50 yards has just gone over the top as far as accuracy. I've like cut my group size in half. Not that I want to shoot that distance, but um, I'll tell you, I'll take any extra speed I can get. Uh, and I, this bow, I, I love. I haven't even shot any of the new ones, uh, but the... Elite system, it's very simple. That's what I've always liked about their bows. But um, we're going to hopefully be working with them uh, this next year. And we kind of have stayed around with Elite all these years just because they're just a good company. They build a great product. Uh, and I just like their their overall brand and, um, and their styling and everything. Uh, not saying there's not other good bows out there, but I just like the way Elite shoot. And they're a great hunting bow. Right. And if any of you um, wonder why when you're watching any of our web shows, you know, there's a couple different people that shoot different bows. It's just because we don't have a hard and fast rule right now today. If you're thinking about, you know, wanting to get on a team, we don't have a hard and fast rule today about exactly what you need to shoot just because, uh, 
that's just not Todd's style. And, and um, if, if someday, if someday, you know, our sponsor dictates that, we'll certainly take a look at that. But um, that's just our personal preference, and certainly we think that it's the best. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't shoot it. Yeah, I mean, that, that, usually that's kind of how I've always handled sponsorship stuff. Is you always lead with your, um, you know where the rubber meets the road, put your money where your mouth is. And I think we do a pretty good job of showing the effectiveness of this equipment and why we use it. And I think once people kind of, oh, anybody who knows me, they know I'm not going to use anything because somebody pays me to use it. It's always the the back end, which is, this is the only thing I'll use. Now, would you like to pay it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but but that's how I've always, I've always done it. And, there, there, you know, it just, some of the stuff you could go crazy trying to get everybody to shoot the same thing. Uh, but... I, this is just what I've used, and, and I've been changing some things along the way. It's not like I have been using the same thing for 100 years, but in some cases, that's the case. Lone Wolf, I'll never switch. Um, but, like, uh, you know, sights and arrow rests and that kind of stuff, I've evolved over the years, and I, I think we've got a pretty good um, pretty good group of companies that we work with, uh, and just the products that I use, I can tell you this much, are right up at the top, period. So Yeah, I- I would agree. Hey, you know that that brings up an interesting question. So we've we've covered the bow, um, and we'll get to the other you know parts of the bow. But uh, one thing that popped into my head, and I'm just I've you and I have never had the conversation is what what do you shoot for a release? I have an old true ball um, copperhead. I mean, the thing's like ten, fifteen years old. It actually is kind of wearing on my string. I need to replace it, but I'm so old school and used to that release. I, I felt really bad about doing it mid season, but, um, I've had that for a long time. I'm the next release I get, it's going to be a Scott. Probably I actually tried one on, uh, at the bow shop not too long ago. Um, and I dig them. I just, that's one thing I'm kind of paranoid about switching. Cause I've, it, it fits me so perfectly and it's just like an extension of my wrist. And I just, I shoot really well with it. So, but I'm going to be making the switch this year. How about yourself? I thought you, uh, I shoot a Fletch hunter. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Oh. <laughs> I don't even know what you're talking about. Like, I think I was shooting that in, in high school, which was like 1970, or excuse me, 1990. I still shoot a, a flipper rest, though, because those are still the best. <gasps> right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, ears. I shoot a... Uh, I, first of all, anybody that knows me or that's listened to me on this podcast knows I'm not a gear guy. Just you know, put it in my hand, and if I can hit the target, I'm happy. But I believe I shoot a Carter. Uh, I want to call it a chocolate addiction, or maybe it's just a. You have Carter. a handheld. Yeah, so thumb okay. thumb thumb release. Although I will say, uh, after the podcast that I did with Donnie Monroe, who's one of our team members, uh, I, I realized that uh, I never thought of myself as one of having target panic Mm -hmm. so uh i really listened to what he had to say and went up to the to the local um archery club here and uh you know took the back tension release and just you know closed my eyes and learned how to use it learned how to use it learned how to use it and i will say that i never felt so good this year when i shot the deer that i did um when i released the arrow there was no question in my mind that i was going to hit where i was aiming at um, so I didn't use that back tension release uh, for obviously for hunting, uh, although I know some people do or some form or another of that. But I use my Carter chocolate addiction thumb thumb release. Well, anyway, I like chocolate as well. But I just don't like it on my release. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, for rests, I think you shoot a vapor trail, correct? I do not. Oh, I, you have a, a QAD. I'm just joking. No, QAD makes a good one, too. I shoot. I like the Vapor Trail. I've been using it for years. Um, I, dude, I've just, the accuracy is really good, um, and I've just never had any issues with them mid-season as far as coming loose or coming uh, out of adjustment. And that I've gone through three or four others over the years because I, mid-season, all of a sudden, boom, the thing would just come undone. Um, and I can't handle that in the middle of the season. Like, that's the last thing. So Vapor Trail's. I love. I don't have a problem with mine. It always stays adjusted, and it's just. But once you have it adjusted, it's there. I'll agree with you on the vapor trail thing, and just let me defend myself so ears doesn't come unglued because he did on one of my Instagram posts. 
Um, I had a picture of my elite bow with a QAD rest on it, and he just basically booed it. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so I did. It's kind of like when people post Huey Men's pictures, you know? Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, so I, the only reason that I, I have that on there is uh, A, I liked it. Um, B, I don't know the difference. David is a huge um, limb driver fan. Um, he won't shoot anything, you know, he won't shoot anything but that. Um, but it was just there's a recent well have you heard their spiel the limb driver yeah no basically you're basically you have your arrow rest stays in contact with your arrow the longest of any of the dropaways because of the way that it's driven by your limb so what that means is basically your arrow has far more um aiming time aiming juice on the uh the arrow rest meaning it basically stabilizes the arrow a little bit better and it just is more accurate um the other thing i do dig about it is there's zero possibility of your rest hitting your fletchings period that's what makes it special it absolutely drives it out of the way there's no way it can happen it's physically impossible um so that's what makes it um the the rest i like it's different uh it looks different it's got a rope that attaches the top of your uh your limb as opposed to usually on your cable slide or on your actual cable. Um, and at first, I was like, oh, man, that looks like it would get caught or whatever. And now I've been using them for probably four or five years, and I've never had an issue, never caught anything. And trust me, I drag my bow through more brush than most. So uh, anyway, I like it. There's a ton of good ones out there. QAD makes a good one, and actually that'll get us right into our next, uh, next product. Um, but I started shooting QAD Exodus broadheads, last year uh, and anybody who knows me will be shocked at that because they're a thick head um, but i've from like 2003 give or take on i've been shooting uh, mechanical broadheads i always shot a three blade large cut on a uh, large large diameter cut one and three quarter and i shot almost any brand out there um I always liked them. They did a great job. I've killed a ton of deer with them, but for one reason or another, I ended up kind of having some bad experiences with some different broadheads and just the size of these bucks that I'm killing now, they're absolute monsters. They're, you know, 300 pounds in some cases on the hoof. So the muscle structure, the bone structure is a whole different animal. And these animals, you only have so many opportunities. And so I kind of wanted to get back to shooting an incredibly tough, little bit smaller cutting diameter head just so that I could take some different angled shots um, and have far better penetration and get better blood trails. I just was not having the blood trails that I that I wanted because I was just not getting pass-throughs on, on these big, big animals. And so one of my local bull shops, they recommended them. Um, and uh, I, shot, I actually bought them for my wife initially. And screwed them on my my arrow just as a joke to see how badly they flow they they would fly because I've every single fixed head I've ever shot never fly straight, uh, which is why I always shot mechanicals. And then um, I screwed it on, shot at fifty, it was perfect. Shot again at fifty, I couldn't believe it, and it was just like, are you serious? So then I shot some does with them last year. Um, had unbelievable results, like no joke. Um, and, and not the best shots either. And then I shot, uh, two bucks and a doe with them this year. And I will just say this much, man, the blood trails are incredible. They act, they, they, they're only like a one in three ace, I think cut. I might be wrong. I think they're a one in three ace actual diameter cut, but the blade angle, the blade thickness and the absolute stupid sharpness of these broadheads, it gives you bigger cuts than the actual broadhead. I don't know how they're doing it, but dude, I think just the sharpness of them, the blood trails are absolutely insane. I mean, insane. I've never seen anything like it out of a fixed head, especially. It's just like mind blowing to me. So I'm a believer. We're going to try to get them as a sponsor because I like straight up, dude, these heads are just unbelievable. So uh, what heads are you shooting right now, Jason? Well, I, let me just back up and I'll answer your question in just a second. But do you think that a broadheads ability to make a deer bleed relates to where the shot is placed more than it relates to the actual structure of the broadhead itself or yes and no Uh, okay obviously placement is everything and and that's the tough part about broadheads is that when a person loses a deer of course it's the broadhead's fault 
Um, I always wondered what the Indians that's, blamed. That's, that, that's never true. That gold dang piece of rock must have broke. Right. Um, anyway, <laughs> you can imagine the old you can imagine the old napping the old napping excuses that went all the way back. Um, anyway, I the Exodus has, in my opinion, like dude, I can't even get them out of the package onto an arrow without cutting myself. I mean, they're so the sharpness on these things are beyond anything I've ever seen. I've shot some really, really good ones over the years some, and really sharp ones. And I always used to resharpen them out of the package, you know, just touch them up on all these different heads just to make sure they were sharp. But dude, it's, if you talk to any doctor or anybody, there's a reason why doctors are using surgical stainless steel straight blades. Um, the sharper, the full, straighter, the cut of through any artery, um, any vein, any meat tissue, it does something that allows the it, it makes it more difficult for something to heal when you have a super super sharp cut and it it won't cauterize as quickly and it won't clot as quickly. Um, I think in general the biggest difference on really really sharp sharp broadheads number one is if your penetration goes through the roof because it's just physics. You're not pushing as hard to push an object through uh, you know a, a solid matter or whatever. Um, but what I like about QADs is just they're bullet tough I mean, you could shoot them through a, a steel drum the blades are super thick but there's something about their blade angle and that's the combination of that with that sharpness um and then you know that's great but if you can't get them to fly straight who cares uh but that's what dude i they're they're very short little tips but they're um the balance or the weight on them must be very similar to a, a field point because they fly incredible better than any any fixed that i've ever shot and again that's the only reason i really started shooting mechanicals was i just got sick of trying to broadhead tune and wearing my targets out every year with broadheads um and so with mechanicals you know you shoot them a few times as long as they're shooting straight you're like okay you shoot field points well that's how these are you don't have to practice with them much once you know that your arrows are shooting straight um i just have that confidence with them but yeah when you see i'm gonna i'll put it to you this way when you see the blood trail that we got from walter payton You'll understand what I mean, but it was absolutely like, dude, Texas Chainsaw freaking massacre. I I couldn't agree more. I I so your question to me was what broadhead do you shoot? I started the year yes. shooting um, the Rage Hypodermic because I don't know it was all the rage um, and marketing and advertising works, brother. I'm telling you, right? Yeah. And and I had had horrible luck. Um, a couple of years ago when I shot the Rage Extreme, um, I felt like uh, it just, it was horrible for penetration for whatever reason, whether it was me or whether it was the head, I, I don't know. So I went back to the Rage Hypodermic that I had good luck with. Uh, I took Chloe, my stepdaughter, out. Um, we shot a doe uh, on my private ground in, I don't know, late September, early October. I torched her. I absolutely torched her. You'll see that on an upcoming web show. And I, you know, I was excited. Um, I figured I would have gotten, you know, a, a beautiful pass through. I figured the arrow would be laying 20 yards behind the deer in the pond. Um, and uh, to my surprise, um, there was a ton of blood right at the um, entrance wound or exit uh, of the entrance wound. And uh, after that, no blood at all. And and I um, you'll you'll see the I made a perfect shot, which is quite uncommon for me. Um, but I made a, a perfect shot, and it, it, it you did. I, I remember seeing the picture. It never bled. It just never bled. And then conversely, um, I was over at CNC Archery. Shameless plug for the pro shop here across the river um, from me here in Wisconsin Dells. He you know I was telling him that you were just a, an absolute nutcase about these uh, QAD heads, and he's like, I got a ton of them right here, and uh, he sold me some. So that's what I shot my buck with, and uh, I, I shot that deer. And, and again, you'll see on an upcoming web show the the blood trail that that thing left. Um, I absolutely torched that deer as well i still have the heart in my freezer i hope judy doesn't ever figure that out because she'll flip when she sees it um just because i saved it because of the damage that that had did to the heart uh 
I was impressed. I was absolutely impressed. So I am I am uh, sold on the QAD uh, hat as well. And and again, you could ask all of our different team members, and they all might have a different opinion. Um, and it's it's all it's all personal preference, I guess, at this point. But we we uh, we're both um, in in concert um, on that. Oh, dude! I, and you know, I, and I'm just gonna say it this way. There's certain things I'm really anal about, and one thing that I will never, ever bend on, and I don't care what anybody tells me, is a two-blade versus a three-blade. In my opinion, two-blade broadhead, it gives you, um, it doesn't put any advantage in your court. Yes, you can get some, you can get some two-blades that cut 48 inches now, <laughs> and that's good, <laughs> um, until you hit any bone or any solid, solid muscle mass, then your penetration just goes through the pooper. Um, but I'm, I'm here to tell you, you, a three blade broadhead, your, your opportunity, your, your opportunities just go up. Number one, it creates a hole as opposed to a slice. The other thing, the other reason I like a three blade is that I tell you, I've had a lot of shots over the years and that's where experience I think trumps anything. I have had a lot of shots over the years that weren't perfect. And the orientation of my blades could have made a difference in whether I would have recovered an animal or not. And what I mean by, let me give you an example where I shot Walter Payton was a low heart shot. If I was shooting a two blade mechanical broadhead and the blades were rotating in a different direction, I may have missed the heart with a three blade. You're just cutting in, in two directions, not one direction. You're not, in one, you're in one plane with a two blade broadhead with a three blade broadhead. You're actually in three different planes. I just believe your odds go up. I think that they, uh, give you a better all-around uh, wound channel. And for me, it's all about cutting tissue. All about cutting tissue. But if you stop before you can pass through the animal, you don't get the blood trail on the other side. And that's, that's cost me a lot of meat over the years, I can tell you that much, because I've had to let them go overnight because I just didn't have blood. But uh, um, I don't know. I am a believer. I think if you can get, if I can get any of you guys just to screw one, try one of those... Um, those QADs, and once you see how they fly, it kind of changes your opinion because you're like, okay, yeah, I can see shooting that because it flies exactly like a field point. Um, and I, we we don't need to beat this to death. They're not even a sponsor of us. I've probably spent a thousand dollars on their heads in the last two years, but I'm telling you, they they're they're pretty sweet. And I, and I've showed a few different people, including Brad Coonert, about them. And all of a sudden, they're asking me by text, "Hey, what was the name of that broadhead you showed me again?" Um, and for Brad Cooner to say that after seeing uh, the Donnie Barasco shot, that's pretty. That's saying something, right? Right on. So I was kind of excited about that. But um, I always, I've been shooting Easton arrows for years. My philosophy is Easton's pretty much the king. They've been doing this stuff as long as anybody. They've been working in aluminum and carbon fiber and all that for a lot of different industries for years. So. Um, when it comes to manufacturing, a lot of these companies are using are outsourcing their manufacturing specifically overseas. I would say most of the aero manufacturers are now coming out of China, Taiwan, Korea, or wherever. Um, Easton, I'm not sure if they're importing or not, but I would say the chances of them being made in the USA with the best materials is probably quite high because Easton uses such a volume that they have access to direct distribution in the States, whether it's coming from the U.S. or not. But from the manufacturing standpoint, Easton has some huge advantages over these other aero manufacturers who are just getting them made at a factory in China. Uh, Easton's actually manufacturing in-house. They have their quality control in-house. Um, they have their thumb on the, on the manufacturing far more than any of these other companies because it's in-house. You can't deny that. So I'd rather keep it USA made, uh, support an American company. Uh, I believe Easton's still an American company. Um, but I've always shot Axis. I like the small diameter. You get better, better penetration and less windage. Um, and that's one thing. Here in Iowa, it's windy all the time. So I like a small diameter arrow for that reason. It makes pulling them from targets a pain in the neck. But again, everything's about the hunt. So I'm not going to practice with an arrow that I'm not hunting with. Um, what do you use for arrows, Jason? Well, I, I just want to say whether they are or are not made in the United States, the one thing I've learned in um, being in, I'll call it show business, for lack of a better way of describing it, someone will let you know if you're wrong, Todd, so don't worry. Um, I'm sure. I, I'm guessing by the time this airs, within a week, you'll know whether they're made in the USA. You don't even bother researching it. Um, what kind of arrow do I shoot? Same thing, Easton, yeah. Axis. That's what I've always yeah, shot. I, I mean, um, all right, I got to be honest. I'm shooting the double X 75s. Uh, Dude, the old <laughs> Chuck Adams Super Slam, brother. Right on, brother. Orange. 
Uh, oh my white gosh. feathers. I shot all of those for you. Oh my god! No, I'm shooting the Easton Axis. Twenty three fifteen, I think. I shot a twenty two something. I don't remember what it was. Like it was a tree log. I, sh- I remember one time when I was uh, about. Let me think. 15, 15. I would have been about sixteen. Okay, and. I had never shot my, I had no, I didn't really have too many people around me who were big hunting. I was hunting alone at that time because I'd grown up hunting with fish, a couple of different neighbors. So I was alone and I was like, my neighbor up at our cabin was, I had wounded a deer and he said, well, have you shot your, you know, your arrows with your broadheads? And I was like, no, I'm too tight. You know, I don't want to ruin a broadhead. He's like, well, you've got to try. So it turned out my arrows were totally wrong spine. So I was shooting like two feet off with my broadheads and, um, so he lent me some arrows, and I think they were 2315s. And that was my first lesson in, in arrow spine and broadheads. So by the time mechanicals came out, I was raring to shoot something that didn't fly like an eagle. Donnie Monroe is, uh, is as finicky as a shooter as you are. So it'll be interesting to hear his take on some of this when uh, once, this, uh, once this airs. But, uh, you know, one thing I wanted to get back to is you mentioned uh, the deer, the size of the deer that you're shooting down in iowa yeah uh, go for it and, and you're not you're not talking about horn size you're talking about body size and i wanted to just body size. i just think we need to come clean about that whole thing you are you've got your deer thriving um you're you're giving them uh that product called thrive right <laughs> you have no idea what i'm talking about do you todd did i lose you Hello? You there? Yeah. Okay, I lost you at thriving. <laughs> you know, when you're talking about when I, when I see those deer and it looks like they ate the refrigerator, I'm like, holy crap, what supplements does he have them on? I'm like, it's got to be thrive. And the only reason I say thrive is because my wife and I just had a, a very spirited discussion about 30 minutes before we started this about whether or not she should continue to thrive. Um, I don't even know what you're talking about. Okay. okay, well, then it's a bad joke. I'll just edit it out. But it's it's, <laughs> it's like, you know, these supplements that, you know, help you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, uh, so in all seriousness, you know, all jokes aside, there is really nothing that you're feeding them. Is there, I mean, what's what's the secret? Because our deer up here in Wisconsin are nothing like that. Oh, dude, it's just age. You know, that's the biggest difference in it. Years and years and years ago, I had this conversation with uh, Andre DeQuisto from Lone Wolf, and he had, he was hunting and killing giants back then, before I knew anything, but I thought I knew everything because I was on the bow site every day. Um, so I had, I was shooting big mechanicals, and, and he was talking about, yeah, the body size of these big bucks. He said, you're like shooting a bull, you know, like an elk almost. He's like, I've always found that just a, a you know, a good, super tough, fixed head that flies straight works the best. I think he shoots 55 pounds or something like that. I mean, he didn't even care. Like he was the least concerned about performance because in his words, he was like, you know, I like to shoot him at 10 to 20 yards, you know, like, and how do you argue with a guy who's got what he had on the wall at the time, which was, he's a legend, but, um, the, uh, the lesson went on deaf ears because all these years later I had to find out the hard way a couple times. And I thankfully haven't lost any big bucks, um, because of it. But, um, I'll tell you, I've had some very, very bad experiences just with blood trails on deer that I absolutely smoked and like literally, you know, just no blood and with several different broadheads, several different hits, but I'll just say this much. I definitely am going back to, uh, the old school and I, I just, for my for what I'm hunting and killing now, those QADs are just amazing. But the, what make them sweet is just the, the flight characteristics. So anyway, we've beaten this to death. I want to move on to um, sights. Good. Okay. Good. That's what I was just writing down. I am personally right. am shooting the old Cobra four pin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> with the old brass with the old brass pins, bro. Right, and then I uh, what I did is rigged up a little bit of a Christmas tree light and a battery um, so that I'd have some light on those sites because they're not fiber optic. No, I I am. Uh, I, let, let's go with what you're shooting. Sorry, I I need to keep on task. My bad. That's okay. Uh, I 
I shoot spot hog. Um, I switched probably five or six years ago, I think. I, I used to shoot, let, we'll, we'll go back, from once I started shooting more distances, I ended up going with an adjustable pin. Um, and then that cost me an opportunity at shipwreck because I was dinking around with adjusting my pin instead of killing him. So just the time period, I, I realized, all right, I need to get a multiple pin sight because I just there are circumstances in hunting where you just will not have time and I didn't want it to cost me a buck. So that's when I did some research and, dude, Everybody was cr- going crazy over spot hog. And if you look at, if you ever have seen one in person or touched one, you'll see what I mean. But they are, I mean, they are impressive. They're built. There's nothing cheap about them. They're very expensive, in fact. I think the one I'm shooting is like 250 bucks or something. And it's a five pin. Uh, but you can custom order them with whatever pins you want. Their pins are stupid bright. Be- the most bright, beautiful pins ever. Um, I don't like lights. I don't want no batteries. I don't want lighted. You don't want, I don't want any batteries on my bow, man. I mean, I'm sorry, but I don't. Um, and they're bomb proof. I've been shooting them for five years. If you break that site or do anything to it, I would like to see pictures because I, there's no one else on earth that it's harder on these sites, at least whitetail hunting. Um, and I mean, I just, you, you just don't have to worry about it. But again, once you see the construction of these things, they're, they're built so strong and rugged and just simple very simple um there's just i don't know that's the one i'm gonna shoot how about you i shoot the uh trophy ridge react one i think it's called the react one pro uh i again i'm not a gear guy i saw it on the outdoor channel thought it looked cool everybody was shooting it so i'm a i'm a follower i'm not a leader uh, so that's what I ordered and that's what I've had. And again, I'm just happy if I hit the target. Uh, and, yeah. and that's, that's changed, I guess, in the last year. Uh, one, one thing that I did do, and that's super important to me that I, I just like to mention is, um, whatever site I shoot, um, is going to have, I believe it's a 0. 0.0190 size, uh, pin. Does that make, yeah. is, am I stating that correctly? I think so. Yeah, there's usually each one has three or four. I go with a medium one. I don't like the big one. I don't like the tiny one. Okay, I like the tiny one because I'm blind, and the bigger I'm not blind. I'm just I'm near far sighted or near, uh, whatever. I can't see things up close very good. So yep. the bigger that that sight is, uh, or that pin is rather um, close to me, the more it becomes a blur. So the smaller, um, the smaller, the blur and the easier it is that I put it on the deer. So, um, yeah, so that, that's what I shoot. Yeah. Uh, enough said, man. I, no, some, no matter what you shoot, just make sure it's all metal, all aluminum, all, all whatever they're making them out of, but try to stay away from the plastic doohickey kind of ones with all these gears and grinders. And I look at some of the stuff and I'm like, you know, what is, are you trying to just see how many component parts you can possibly jam into one design? Um, so I'm a simplest to me, the best designs are the ones that are absolutely stripped down to the barest bones, the most simple possible designs, because in the field, um, complex usually doesn't equate to success. So, um, let me back up and ask you sort of, and maybe I wasn't completely understanding what you're saying. You shoot a spot hog. I get that. And a spot hog, to me, is an adjustable sight pin. Or, excuse me, an adjustable pin sight, right? No. Uh, they're, well, they make a bunch of different ones. Okay. Um, they've, okay. Got, they've got some uh, some adjustable pin ones, but the one I have is just a, a very simple fixed pin, and it has five pins. I shoot a 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60-yard pin. Um, and the 50 and 60 are just for practice. I would probably never shoot a deer that far. I mean, it just would have to be depend on the circumstances, but, um, but no, I, dude, I love mine. I, I like to shoot all the same pen color. I shoot all green because they're the brightest to me. Um, me and I mean, you I can lower my bow down at last light, like where you can't see to shoot at least, uh, ethically. And you can still see the pins glowing at the end of your bow rope. So I, they're, they're a killer sight. They're kind of pricey, but you know, if you're spending a thousand bucks on a bow, you know, what's an extra couple hundred dollars, right? <laughs> well, you know, really, and, and if it's going to make that much difference, it's, a, it's an important part. It's, it's Well, it's, and you buy one, you buy it for life. You know, I mean, generally, I think we always get new accessories for our bows, but I mean, dude, this thing will last you forever. And that's what I like about them. They're just bomb proof. You will never break a pin. You'll never break a fiber optic. 
I've never had an issue with mine. And again, I'm pulling mine through brush like you've never seen before. Like, it's ridiculous. Um, but from there, I think we pretty much covered the bows. There's a lot of other accessories that you can go with um, and talk about. And, and Luminox are one I'm not even going to get into. I just have terrible experiences with them. Um, and not just, I've never actually shot a Luma knock, but I've had bad experience with lighted knocks in the past. Are you, try are you knocks. back to not shooting lighted knocks? No, I, I am shooting them. They just don't work. I'm, like, I'm going to kill myself. I swear. I've spent so much money on trying to make it right. And yeah, what's the problem so, other than operator uh, air? I don't, you know, in the middle of hunting season, the last thing I feel like doing is taking my quiver out of my truck, sitting down, taking a knockout, playing with it. I expect the stuff to just work. And they sometimes don't. You just I, There's not enough time in the day to do what I do and, have, and be able to sit and double check everything. So anyway, I guess I'll have to design a knock next. But no, I've heard really good things about Luminox over the years. Um, I'm going to try those next and we'll go from there. But um, I think... Just to stay on uh, on track with um, with the gear we really really rely on, um, Lone Wolf. We've talked and about it, and we probably don't need to go into crazy detail because I think anybody listening by now knows uh, that we're Lone Wolf super fans. Um, and I actually used to design uh, stuff for Andre and then the new owners, and so I, I've been very involved with the company uh, over the years. And there's just, there's not another tree stand that has the quality um, that lone wolves do. They're expensive, but they're made in the USA and they literally will last you forever. So if you want to buy a tree stand for half the price and trust that with your life, that's up to you. Uh, but for me, I'm going to spend money on one thing. Uh, it's going to definitely be the thing I'm standing on 30 feet off the ground or 20 feet off the ground. Um, and to me, once you buy one, you'll understand. But the the quietness and ease of setup makes it worth its weight in gold. And then the fact that they last you literally your whole life. I've got 20-year-old lone wolves that I still hunt out of that are still dead silent. You, all you have to do is replace the belts every once in a while. That's it. Belts and cables. That's it. Belt. Yeah. And I mean, I I honestly, I don't think I've ever replaced the cables. I, I haven't either. I know that, uh, you know, Jared just said check make sure there's not any you know chinks in the armor so to speak and, oh, and sure. well one thing to always look at too is on the cables they're they're co coated in a nylon plastic or actually a pvc plastic of some sort um and it basically insulates the cable from noise but it, it also keeps it from rusting and keeps it away from the elements so that there's no issue with any um, any any environmental deterioration gotcha aka rust um, so the one thing you can look at is just look at the, the connecting points of your cables where they basically, um, they seal them together. They typically will have a seam right there. Sometimes that seam works away and you can start to see rust leaking out. Um, just keep an eye on that. If you start to see rust, that's not a good indication. You definitely don't want to be on, uh, equipment that has been uh, sitting in the field and rusting for years. But, um, I think Lone Wolf uses all stainless steel anyway, so... Um, that's never an issue with theirs, but some of the other tree stands out there, uh, I know what materials they're using and trust me, they're not using anything of any quality. So they have a time life and a lifetime and they will fail. Please don't use them until they fail. Um, but if you're going to buy a new stand, Lone Wolf's where it's at, man. Okay. Well, I, I would second that and just say that I have a much greater appreciation for, you know, what a Lone Wolf is and what it does and how it's designed and how well it's built. I have a better appreciation for it this year than I ever have just because it, you know, if it wasn't my number one tool, um, it, it, it was right up there. And, and simply because it just, it was, it was on my back every time I went hunting. And, and just for setting, for setting up and doing what we're doing, like with run and gun and portable hunting, I can't imagine using anything else. Like you're it would make it so much more difficult to be quiet that cast aluminum and their sticks are just money. Their, their climbers are just as good. We don't use the climbers because we don't have any good trees down here, but um, the hang ons in the sticks for us are just like, it's, it's such a vital piece of equipment. I couldn't, I'm hanging tree stands every single day during the season. 
Um, I mean, for Walter Payton, I must have hung six or eight in a week. I mean, it just it's what we do. It's a part of the part of the process. And if you're wondering how we do it, Lone Wolf is a big part of it. At least when we're using free stands, I'll tell you, there's it's just I couldn't imagine trying to use anything else. But um, and there, there's no, there's I, there's no reason um, that you can't make those things quiet. Yes, it's cast aluminum. Yes, they have buckles on them. Um, there's a hundred things that Jared could tell you to do, or any of the folks that uh, answer the phone down there that could help you to to, to quiet it up. That um, are just simple little things. Or uh, I we recently had the uh, DIY sportsman on. Um, just talking about some of the modifications he's done to, um, you know, make, for instance, the buckle on, on the, the stand itself, just cutting a piece of um, inner tube from a bike tire and placing it over that buckle that eliminates that from making that god awful noise that we are all afraid of hearing when we're out there. So there's. And you know, you know, what cracks me up is I've had a bunch of dudes, I, I, I tried that little test thing. To me, I, what concerns me is that that rubber eventually at some point could get jammed into your cam and cause a failure or cause something to slip and so for me it's not dude buckle noise is not an issue if you if you control them so i've just built you know built, built a system around how i control my buckles when i'm setting up and yeah you can make a noise with them here and there but uh, most of that just comes down to taking your time and um, having a little bit of uh, patience and experience and just practice but that's the cool part about lone wolves is you can customize them. We, there's guys who put tape around everything, whatever for silence. But the biggest difference is the cast aluminum compared to tubular steel or tubular aluminum. You've got a, a welded or fabricated tree stand that it has nothing but air pockets inside of it that reverberate sound so badly. It echoes it and it, it just makes everything so loud and noisy, no matter what you do to it, a cast or solid material makes less noise period not to mention it's twice as strong probably three times as strong honestly um and is just super rock solid and your feet don't slip on them they are absolutely super grippy and yeah i mean it's what we use so anyway um enough is about that uh vortex binos is what i've been using for 15 years they're our sponsor i know there are a million other brands out there um, and some of them own camera companies, and many of them are from Japan or China or whatever. Um, Vortex is a USA company. They're based right in Wisconsin. We're friends with a bunch of the guys who work there, and they have been killing it the last few years, and their whole product line has just been growing. So by leaps and bounds, I'm, I'm just I'm so happy for that group because they deserve it. They've done a great job all these years, so it's neat to see a company grow so quickly um, in so many different ways. Yeah, any of you who are business uh, nuts or, or interested in business, take a look at what they've done in the marketplace in the last five years, and they are they are a textbook of example of what it takes to to move the needle. Um, no matter what segment of the um, retail industry that you're in, they they have done a phenomenal job, not only with their product but with their message as well. Other oh, branding, I mean, everything is spot on. They've done such a great job. I'm pro- I'm very happy with them and. There's always a challenge when you're working with companies, you know, from a sponsorship standpoint, because you have no control over the, you know, the direction that they're going. And sometimes that's not in your direction. And that's why, you know, sometimes we've changed sponsors here and there or whatever. Um, But Vortex has always been spot on and they're very, it's a smart company. Like that's what I enjoy about uh, seeing their product line evolve Mm -hmm. is that you can tell there's some smart guys that really, really are passionate about the product line. And that's where it comes in is the passion. And they're still a family-owned business, and, and engineering is run by, I think, one of the brothers. Um, and uh, it's just, you know, that's where you see that that attention to detail, man. It's when people care. And unfortunately, not all companies are like that, especially in the mining industry. There's there's a lot going on with all these uh, huge conglomerations buying up all these small companies. And, gee, it seems like when the inventor is out of the picture, all of a sudden the passion's gone, product quality goes down the pooper. And how many times have we seen that happen? Right. Tons. Tons. And then all of a sudden they're out of business five years later. So um, anyway, Vortex, I don't think we have to say much. Everybody knows Vortex now. And in the last few years, wow. I'll just put it that way. Their their uh, their logo has basically become a, a, a household brand, at least within a huge segment. Well, pretty much with every Donald Trump voter. 
Right. <laughs> um, they and they're they're constructing, and I believe it's if it's not done, it's just about done. Uh, they're they're constructing a new facility uh, in. It's not going to be in Middleton. Uh, they're moving their uh, facility in Middleton all the way out to Barneveld, which is about 31 miles uh, west of Madison. And it's going to be a top-notch facility from what I've told. I have talked to a, a couple of folks um, that are, are working on it, uh, and they are, uh, they're impressed with what they've seen so far. So I'm, I'm anxious to see what it looks like when it's done. That should be sweet. They do everything right, you know. So Absolutely. I, I can only- It'll be cool. Uh, They'll probably have like a telescope that you can literally burn the moon dust off of the moon surface with or something cool. More than Uh, likely. Yeah, I would imagine something along the lines of that. Um, Hey, let's get on real quickly. You know, Ozonics, it's the the title sponsor of our show. At at this point, I think you all know how how much we believe in them. I simply cannot hunt without them. And, And I think... You know, it's almost like the proof is in the pudding. We have so much footage from over the years. And just this season alone, I can tell you story after story after story about you know, how many deer I had to beat in order to kill a particular buck. And, dude, as you know, they're the only thing out there that truly can beat a whitetail over and over consistently. And the only reason why is because it is working the entire time you're out there. You can treat your clothes with ozone. That's fine. As soon as you're up in a tree and you're breathing, they can bust you. makes no difference. You can walk out there naked. They're going to bust you. Um, it doesn't matter what your clothes smell like. I've been saying it for a thousand years. Uh, it, the amount of scent coming off of your body and off of your, out of your mouth, um, out of your eyeballs is small enough that, or enough that a white tail can catch you. You're not going to beat your nose. So you bring in Ozonix, put it up above you and you don't have to worry about it at least to that extent. It probably works. And my system is anal as I am probably 95% of the time. I mean, once or twice a season I might get blown at, uh, but for the most part, if you have them set up properly, you simply can avoid getting blown at any, any longer. And that is just an amazing feat in itself. Right. Give, given the right situation, they're they're flawless, provided you've put them up correctly. I worked a couple trade shows with them this winter, or rather last, you know, whatever, late winter, early spring, and, uh, you know, I was a little bit um, hesitant coming into that situation, just wondering how many, you know, angry people I'd talk to, because let's face it, it's, it's a relatively technical device that if not set up properly, isn't not, it's not going to work. Um, it's also a pricey, um, piece of equipment, but it's pricey for a reason because the technology in there is not cheap. Um, I was shocked at the amount of people that came up and, and just, they would swear by it, whether they were 65 years old or 25 years old and everything, um, in between, above, below, whatever the case may be, uh, I heard tons and tons and tons of good stories. The, the biggest complaint that I heard was, well, I'm, I'm afraid of the noise. And, uh, yeah. you know, J.D. or Cole, one of the guys that works down there at their headquarters in, um, I'm not going to say customer service, their product specialists, they would just tell you, then tip it upside down and, and um, you know, put it so that the... Uh, the exhaust, uh, or excuse me, the fan that's sucking in the air is, is, is or in the air is pointed uh, pointed towards the sky. But uh, I got nothing but great reviews. Um. Dude, knowing knowing what that machine does, I would put a freaking generator up in the tree with me if I had to to run it. You're crazy. Uh, well, you're right. You want to know how crazy? When the Ozonics first came out and I first started using them, they weighed eight pounds a piece, and I used to bring three of them to go hunting with Kyle. I remember it was a shoebox filled with lead. Yes, it was a brick. We called it the Ozonics brick, but they worked, so I didn't care. We brought three of them up on the tree, and oh my gosh, it, you know, that was the first generation, but um, I'm going to say this much about sound control. There's people out there that talk trash about Ozonics or say it doesn't work. If those people weren't working for other scent elimination companies or weren't friends with other scent elimination companies, weren't sponsored by other scent elimination companies, and weren't biased because of other scent elimination companies, you wouldn't hear any negatives. It, it, there's just a lot of money out there in scents, and if you don't believe me, go to the store, look down the spray aisle, and tell me there's not. It is a 
thing that a lot of people make money on, and it helps drive the industry. So I understand from the business standpoint, but I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you this much: there's a reason why we only promote Ozonics, and I never promoted anything before that. We are not like the other companies out there that are just trying to fill our sponsor slots. I will not promote something that truly doesn't work. And in my opinion, if you're not using Ozonics and you're uh, not getting busted, then you either are in a situation that thermals are helping you or like you're, you don't smell because I stink. I sweat like a pig. And I, I have a few buddies who claim that they can get down to the point where they pretty much don't get winded. Um, and that's not me. There's no way. And for the way I hunt and how I get in, I'm sweating my butt off by the time I even get to my stand if it's 20 below zero and I'm not joking. So anyway, Ozonics is it. I put my name on it and, and, and if you don't believe me, then I guess keep getting blown at. I don't know what to tell you, man. Well, and, and I think it should be said that, you know, we've had a couple guests on our show. Uh, Brad Coonard, um, you know, said not that he doesn't believe in it. He, I guess he probably does believe in it, but he just chooses sure. not to use it. And that's great. And, and, and yep. we're not saying that there's anything wrong with that. Um, we're, oh, I- we're saying that it's a tool that straight up scientifically has been proven to work we've seen it work we've documented it working um i just had a conversation with dan infault the other night uh while i was waiting for um my stepdaughter to go through the parade and we were talking about it and he's like you know i'm i'm in the same school of thought as brad i just i, I just choose not to use it he said i uh i think um and i don't want to quote dan um because i don't remember our exact conversation but i'm going to say he led me to believe that you know Actually, let's just avoid that completely. I'm not going to put put words into his mouth if I can't remember it exactly. But uh, you know, it's 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 a personal preference. Here's the fact: it works. Oh, and you know, this is the way I I have been a part of more arguments about Ozonics than anybody in North America, at least online. I'll put it that way. Um, and I've been defending them since. <laughs> It, uh, I've been defending them since the very beginning when the industry wasn't using them and now everybody seems to have them or is trying to knock them off in some way, shape, or form. I, I, will, I will put it very, very simply. You know, some people say it's unethical because, because Ozonix works. So, but it's okay to use other sun elimination products that don't work. Is that ethical? I'm just curious. There's a lot of products out there being sold that don't work at all and actually will never possibly beat a whitetail's nose. Just scientifically, it's impossible to use a bloodhound dog, for example. So because this product works, it's unethical. To me, it's unethical to sell products that don't work. So that's kind of my standpoint on a lot of things, which is why we have a few sponsors and not 50. But um, I don't know. Am I wrong? No, you're not. And we could go on and on and on and on and on. I've got friends in law enforcement, one of them who works for the um works with the ATF. Uh he had a um an arson dog and they had done some uh research using ozonics inside of a rubber made tote, um, having that machine going. Um, I don't know how they vented it, and I'm not exactly sure how controlled the study was, but you know, he even commented that it worked. Um, Clint uh, McCoy, I don't even know that you know this, he's one of our team members, um, but part of his college thesis, I believe, was doing a paper on, and I'm going to try and not botch this, but doing a paper on ozone's effect on eliminating scent on swine farms. Really? Really. So Oh gosh, yeah, that's a huge deal, isn't it? Yeah, because you know, they obviously those pig farms have um a, a tremendous ability to generate scent. So if they can do something to mitigate that, they do. And uh Tell me. Clint Clint had never had an ozone uh, machine um, in the tree with him until this year. Um, he won one in a contest that we ran here, you know, within our team, and uh, he is a believer. Not that he didn't believe it couldn't work um, based on the scientific, you know, principle. Um, he just hadn't used one and uh, is now a believer. So is Donnie Monroe, for that matter, and, and, and um, you know, most of our folks um, 
are using one already. So anyway, we've beat that dead horse enough. Um, yeah, and, and just to reiterate again one more time, we're, if, if you are into your style of hunting and that doesn't include those onyx, good for you. We're not telling you you're wrong or, and we're right. This is just something that helps us. For me, it's the filming part, Jason. If right. I wasn't filming, trying to film all this stuff, like I need every advantage I can possibly get in the area that I hunt, doing hunting the way that I hunt. Um, so that's my justification for it. Uh, and like guys like Brad Coonard or, or different guys who are old school and they just, you know, they they have their beliefs. Hey, that's fantastic. And you know, I think the one thing this industry needs to do a little better job of is um, is agreeing to disagree and still being friendly about it um, and, you know, not pushing, putting people down because they don't have a $1,200 bow set up. You know, to me, I'm all about, I like using the simplest, easiest way of getting the job done and the simpler, the better. But uh, for me, that's where Ozonix is just, it saves so many hunts for me. And then part of my, part of my living making the way I make my living is hunting. So for me, it's a, it's an invaluable tool that just, man i can't even believe how well they work uh and that it's even possible to this day to be honest with you well said um anything else you want to cover yeah for sure uh, you know and we were talking about earlier in the show about uh, some christmas ideas i'll tell you the one one of the products that um that we don't talk enough about and that is one of the greatest tools in our arsenal are the stick and pick camera stands um I've been good friends with the owner Jesse Hurley. They're based in um, in in Wisconsin, up there by you. Uh, what town is he in? I forget exactly. Portage. Um, he's in Cottage Grove, but you might just as well call Cottage. him Addison. Anyway, um, he makes everything. He's adamant about making everything 100% U.S. It's all metal construction. The cool thing about Stick and Pick is the price point. So if you're looking to buy um, a, a small stocking stuffer, excuse me, stocking stuffer, all the way to a nice gift. Uh, Stick and Pick has stuff that goes down to like 20 bucks, I think. Like their their camera stands, um, their tree mounts. They've got a tree, two different tree mounts and a couple different uh, camera stands that are just independent stands. And, dude, their stuff is just, it is the coolest gift ever because once you try it, they're going to just go nuts over it because it just makes setting tra- trail cameras so much easier. It's just uh, you forget how bad it is until you you got the one camera with the busted off thread insert or whatever, and you got to strap it to a tree, and you're just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that all those years. Um, so big shout out to Stick and Pick. Um, if you're looking for a gift idea, that's one that would be fantastic um, for anybody who enjoys hunting, uh, because they absolutely have any, have something for any price point, and it's just a cool gift that anybody can use. Um, if you're looking for something a little bit um, a little bit higher end Spartan cameras make a full product line. And that's one thing I want to mention. A lot of people think Spartan only makes the, the cell, uh, cell camera. Okay. And I'm old school. I still run a, a variety of everything. So I have several Spartan cell phones, but I still use traditional cameras and, and I use those Spartan specific, specific, specific spots. And then I use the other Spartans out everywhere else, but they make a phenomenal camera that retails what what is the retail on One, there 139.99 uh, okay for 140 bucks they make the best just straight up trail camera and it's not the cell phone version but it's basically their cell phone camera without the cell service um but dude just the functionality the quality of the construction is absolutely phenomenal that's what i fell in love with spartan with the the case construction the hinges the seals all the hardware a lot of those other cameras are garbage and they fall apart after a few years and Spartans are built really, really well for the money. I, I, for the money, it's the best camera out there. So um, don't feel like they only have you know four or five hundred dollar cameras. They've got cameras at really reasonable prices that work fantastic and are so simple. And that's what we love about them. Um, Spartan cameras, fantastic. Stick and pick, can't say enough. You know, just to speak to that point i was at the columbia county sheriff's department uh, which is the local um law enforcement uh agency here in the county that i live in um we donated uh a stick and pick and a spartan camera to them um and uh um they've used it 
Um, they used it all summer. They had used a couple other cellular-based phones, or excuse me, cellular-based cameras, and uh, did an interview with uh, with those guys yesterday and filmed it for Spartan Camera. And, you know, they're not getting paid anything. As a matter of fact, they just paid to buy one retail. Um, <laughs> it was the end. Yeah, so seriously, we gave them one. They loved it. You know what they love most about it? What's that? The battery life and yep. the ability to truly manipulate it from the office or from home if they've got a covert operation on a on a marijuana grow um you you can't be going in there messing around changing settings on a camera um it has to be reliable and that's the the thing that they liked about it not to say that they're never going to break theirs has never broke um it sat on a um well, I can't. I, I guess I can't say, but um, it, it sat in several different positions uh, without having a flaw. One, one particular example that that uh, Ben, um, the, the sergeant that I spoke with, brought up yesterday is um, they realized that they had the flash too high um, because it was back getting backlit and washing out the. Um, uh, washing out the picture. So he had asked me about it. I'm like, just go in and change the setting. He's like, how can I do that? I'm like, just go in and change it from the flash from high to low. They did that. Boom. Done. Didn't have to go anywhere. Didn't have to do anything. They just did it. Dude, it's a cool tool. Like I know. And that's another guys are like, well, that's like cheating. You know, you're taking the, the hunt out of, you know, the, the whole situation. Well, you know, when I was hunting Walter Payton, I got a picture of him a day before I killed him and I ended up killing him like three. It was about a half mile away. So it's not like that's just not how it works. That's not how deer work. And I'll tell you, if you if you think, and I'll the other secret, which is a whole another conversation. But you know, trail cameras are fantastic tools. But a few years ago, after I had been hunting these individual deer year after year after year, and I started to realize the rotations and their circuits and where what they how they work, I just stopped checking my cameras that much during hunting season. And I shouldn't say that during the rut, because uh, if you are chasing bucks on cameras, you're always going to be one step behind. And even with a Spartan man, they don't just like, you know, go go away from the camera 50 yards and bet down and wait for you to come and shoot them. What? Uh, yeah, no kidding, right? Yeah, well, unless you have the Spartan lasso we- uh, app, then you can have uh, a little <laughs> lasso attached to your camera. Right. But... Um, it's just another tool, but what I what I have found to be the most interesting aspect from the science of it is to be able to get pictures on your phone real time. So you're sitting on the couch, and so at you know nine thirty at night or whatever, you're sitting there eating popcorn, watching TV, and you get a picture, and you know what deer is active where. And over a period of a time, you just learn so darn much about when deer are moving, where they're moving at different spots. Um, And a lot of surprises, you know, about what times of day and and just how, you know, if you've got multiple cameras out and they all start running, getting pictures at different times. Um, But for me, it's it's been a huge way to eliminate areas that I I don't want to hunt. I don't use my nearly as much to know where to hunt, meaning if I know where a big buck's at, I'm not the type of person that likes to go put 20 cameras around to get pictures of that buck. I just want to kill him. So I'll put cameras where I suspect he might be. And when I don't get pictures, then it just reinforces, all right, he's back in his core area or whatever. And so I use mine probably different than a lot of guys, but, um, just for security purposes alone, you know, I got pictures of a trespasser on one of my farms this this earlier summer. And, you know, I got that the day it happened as opposed to a week later or two, two weeks later. So I contacted the landowner and within a few days we figured out who it was and it wasn't a big deal. They were there accidentally, but, um, you know, that's that's the nice thing. It's it kind of does put your eyes on your property, you know, when you just when you can't be there. Uh, but it doesn't mean it's like an ethical, in my opinion, uh, to say that, like, you know, having a cell phone camera kills these deer for you. It points you in the right direction a lot of ways, but it's up to you to uh, it's up to you to sift through the intel and, and to to make it happen, so to speak. It's it, it's merely just another tool to gather information. And in, it just so happens that it eliminates that intrusion factor uh, when you can do that. And for me this year, just the ability to not have to drive an hour, hour and a half to check a camera, um, that saved a lot of money and a lot of 
you know, just a lot of time. Um, I, 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 Jason, I can't imagine every year how many deer, how many big bucks are saved because of the impatience of hunters checking their cameras to, because they want to get a picture of that buck. Um, and I've done it so many years and it, it, like it's the human, you know, instant gratification, instant gratification. Well, this is a way you can get instant gratification without ruining your hunting area. So that's one way to look at it. So it actually will save your properties um, because especially inexperienced hunters and believe me, man, guys, I was there. <laughs> I, I, be, I used to beat trails down to my cameras and be checking them every three or four days. And then I started to kind of come to the realization like, OK, you know. You're doing more harm than good. And once you once you know a deer's in the area, then it's up to you to hunt them down and kill them. Uh, it's not up to your trail cameras to do the jab for you. So you can take anything with a grain of salt you hear here. These are just our opinions, and I'm very opinionated. So um, just because I believe in one thing and say it strongly, um, uh, there's many different ways to slice a cat. True. Oh, if you slice cats if, regularly. If you do that. Um, Clint would not be a fan fan of that <laughs> i love kitties i have a cat i don't and i don't I love like cats i'm a dog guy and you and clint are definitely cat guys but uh anyway anything else i, I can't really think of anything nope. other than i have a whole conversation about cats and whitetails uh they are actually quite similar oh really yeah you know what yep. you're right they are they really are it's amazing like they they have attitudes um dogs are just stupid yeah. Duh, 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 duh. Cats are very articulate. I like my cat. <laughs> he's like you or she or yes. He yeah, he's bipolar. I swear, just like I am. So, no, I'm just teasing about dog and stuff. I'm just not personally a dog person because they usually chase deer and cats are more on the riding of deer type. So that's cool with me. But um, no, man. Other than that, hand warmers are probably the greatest tool of all time. But that's a whole other se- separate category. Gotcha. Is that it? All right, I think it is. I don't think we have a whole lot else to go over. We managed to take an hour and ten minutes. I'll cut some of that out. Well, there you have it. A completely uh, uncharacteristic show from Todd and myself. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you took some uh, some good little nuggets of information away there. Uh, if you have uh, a question about any of the things that we talked about, be sure to email either Todd or myself, Jason at whiteknuckleproductions.com or Todd at whiteknuckleproductions.com. We'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Um, as always, please give us a review on iTunes. Come on, man. Uh, or women or whatever uh, or however that's supposed to be said. We need uh, we need your reviews on iTunes or Stitcher or uh, Google Play or whatever it is that you can give us a review on. We'd certainly appreciate the love. So go give us a review, please. Um, with that, I think I'll close out the show today. I just want to say thanks again to our title sponsor of our show, Ozonix. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do what it is that we do. So uh, Ozonix rocks. Um, if you haven't seen the email blasts or any of the um, posts that they've had on social regarding the sale on their uh, uh, HR300 or HR200, whatever the case, go to their website, ozonicshunting.com and uh, check it out. There's some killer deals. So with that, have a good rest of your day. Hope you enjoyed the show. Jason out.